what's interesting about that song and passage that he will hold us fast is as we get through these sticky passages that every passage somewhere in the Bible is going to jab somebody a certain way and cause them to think or you to think or us to think that this is where I check out because I can't handle this command or I can't handle this thing because this is the one. I All this other stuff that we heard about in the last six months, yeah, this, yeah, this, yes, yeah, oh yes, I, I can do this. All of a sudden, boom, there's one that it's like, okay, this is, this is where I get off. This is where I check out. Mostly because I can't handle it. But then in reality is, is this because, or, let me back up. The excuse is, is I don't agree with that. But the reality is, is, well, I have to say I don't agree with it because I know that I can't accomplish that. And that's the same way with people when they're uh, addicted to things and they, they try to justify it because they're, they're in bondage to doing that and they, they can't press on. And, and they think they can't press on, but like we just learned from the song and what we learned from the passage in Isaiah is that once we're his, he will carry us through. So of course he's going to bring us sticky situations that we look at and say, this is where I get off the bus because I cannot do this, but I'm going to act like I disagree with it because I just know I can't go along with this. But remember, he will hold us fast and we're his. He's going to cause us to be able to do it. Of course it's going to be hard. That, that, <laughs> We were, we were signed up at Philippians 1.29 to not only be saved, but also to suffer for his sake. So there's going to be sticky passages. And oh, here we are, marriage and family today. So let's go ahead and get started on this as we are excited to be here uh, once again. And here we are um, talking about marriage today. <coughs> Excuse me. Marriage is one of the areas in a Christian's life most attacked by Satan. I don't know if anybody here has noticed that, but it's a fact. And this is because marriage is a holy institution of God, which is to represent the relationship of the two parties, Christ and his church, to the watching world, and even to your kids. I'm going to say this again. Marriage is a holy institution of God that is to represent the relationship of the two parties of Christ and the church. To the watching world and your watching kids. Your marriage teaches people the relationship between Christ and the church. Your marriage is actually gospel ministry to your kids and to the watching world. By, me by misrepresenting the two parties, and Satan can undermine the effectiveness of God's proclamation. Okay, by misrepresenting the two parties, Satan can undermine the effectiveness of the gospel presentation because if one of the two parties is, is represented as off, the whole gospel's off. Well, Satan wants to do that. And as we've learned, the word misrepresenting someone is actually called slander or blasphemy. And with this, what Satan does is he tempts the husbands to sin by misrepresenting Christ as being either an abusive tyrant or a wimpy mama's boy who was ran over by his wife. Or even at the same time, both uh, man, Satan tempts mankind to do this. As a little boy inside of a big boy's body to throw temper tantrums when he doesn't get what he wants. In other words, Satan wants to tempt man, men to, to be mama's boys or to be tyrants. And with the little boy inside that's raging. And he wants that to look like, to make it look like Christ is like that. And we can get into it a little bit more when you look at the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church who wants to portray Christ as going to his mommy for everything and that his mommy's in charge and we need to go to Jesus' mommy, Mary, to, to tell him, to tell her what we want so that she will make sure that her son does these things for us. And, and so it's misrepresented. He also tempts wives to sin by misrepresenting the church as being either a battered victim or a bossy demanding adulteress who calls the shots with their husband or both at the same time as a spoiled little girl who thinks she's deprived and therefore gets her love or other things somewhere outside of her marriage. So as we see with all of his schemes, Satan always tries to flip things around. And so the natural tendencies we'll see for a man 
is to misrepresent Christ, and the natural tendency for a woman is to misrepresent the church, and both of those working together sends a whole new uh, representation of what the gospel looks like to your kids and to the world. And even more vulnerable than this, than this faulty uh, marriage that you're displaying, or this faulty gospel that you're displaying through your marriage, we have this whole thing called the so-called same-sex marriage, which in reality is, is, is an abomination to God, and it is God's wrath of abandonment, which he says in the end times that he would be doing, Romans 124, that that whole, that whole thing is a complete abomination and misrepresents everybody, and God, has, uh, God hates it. So what's happened, though, is we see that in, in, in the last, for a long time, we see churches have bought into various parts of these lies in the church itself. We know the world's all messed up, but the church itself is, has bought into these things, and that's because the natural man and woman's depraved default is for themselves rather than God. That's the natural person. We're all selfish. And so the natural default is, is we're going to fall into self-preservation rather than caring about the other person. And we've been talking about all these things in Ephesians. And so with this, though, well, first of all, the world hates God's ways. And therefore, the world is going to love the ways of the depraved man. In other words, the man is going to want to be selfish and do what he wants. And the woman's going to want to be selfish and do what she wants. That's the natural thing that, that we have here. And so with this then, even Christians can struggle with these things. I don't know if anybody here has ever experienced that, as we will see, uh, that there's different types of these things that happen. But if the Christian is not filled with the Holy Spirit, the Christian is going to fall into these things too. And the part that we're in is that uh, learning that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When Christians do not live a godly marriage according to their roles, they present a false gospel to their children and the watching world, like we said. He or she, listen to this part, he or she who does not represent godly roles for women and children contribute to this whole thing called gender confusion. A Christian who doesn't act as a Christian man or a Christian woman sends the message of gender confusion to the watching world. That's pretty heavy. That, that you actually have, as we look outside and we see this whole gender confusion thing, who started that? All of us did in our sin by not representing the role that we're supposed to be in. So he or she participates in gender confusion and then Satan laughs because uh, sinners then send out a false message of what a man looks like and what a woman looks like. So here we are once again, Ephesians chapter 5. We're in 522 through 33 today. We're starting out a two-part series, 522, Ephesians 522 through 33. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water, with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, <clears throat> because we are members of his body. And for this reason, and this is, uh, as we will see, study even more, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you is also to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife see to it that she, is, that she respects her husband. So we're in the section of Ephesians where Paul has just finished caught, uh, commanding Christians to submit to the Holy Spirit within them rather than living according to their flesh. And he laid out three consequences of submission to the Holy Spirit that affect your relationships, three relationships. And we talked about 
that the first consequence of being filled with the Spirit is your relationship with yourself, that you're going to have joy in yourself, that you're not, you, you have peace within yourself. And that, that joy is going to pour out into, into songs and testimonies to other believers. The second relationship is, is with each other. And the third re uh, relationship is, your, is with God. And so when you're Spirit-filled, your relationship with yourself, others, and God is going to be good. When you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, there's going to be turmoil. And so the last one here, uh, talking about, and we talked about in verse 521, is being subject to one another. So we primed the pump two weeks ago on what this means to submit to one another because we know that if you're not filled with the Spirit, you cannot have the attitude or actions of submitting to other people because you're going to be selfish. That's the natural default. So we learned that. We primed the pump because now we're going to get into these relationships, like I said, where some people may want to get off the bus because <laughs> it gets too hot, but we're going, to, we're going to go ahead and plow through this. Why? Because we're equipped to as Christians. We're going to be able to handle this. So Paul then set the groundwork for these sticky and conflict-ridden relationships that we have, starting with the most close, intimate, and influential one, marriage. So here we go. <clears throat> Once again, and what we're going to see here in this passage is, and like I said, it's a two-part series, so we're going to deal with the first half of it or the first parts of it today. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 overall shows three aspects of how husbands and wives are to represent Christ in the church so that you will accurately witness the gospel in your marriage. So we saw this in our scripture reading earlier, God's plan for marriage. We're going to talk about God's plan first. God made men out of dust and personally breathed life into him, which we read earlier. God then took the man who he created outside the garden and placed him in the garden. We saw that earlier. God commissioned the man to oversee and work the garden, and God gave him one prohibition, is you can eat from any tree in the garden except for that. <clears throat> Second, we see, and we're going to read this again in Genesis 2, not again, we're going to read in Genesis 2 again, and we're going to now go to verse 18, and we're going to move ahead with this, this plan for marriage, and, the, and actually the purpose of marriage, 2.18, Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast in the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call him. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was his name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds in the sky and to every beast in the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of the ribs and closed it up the flesh at, at that place. The, Lord's, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said this, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the woman, the man and the wife were both naked and not ashamed. So we see this, we see this right here. The purpose of marriage was to solve the alone problem. The purpose of marriage was to solve the alone problem. And marriage is God's only plan for man being alone. <clears throat> the woman was to be his helper, being a practical partner that makes up what the man lacks. Yes, the man lacks things and needs the woman to make up things that the man lacks. This partnership then is to achieve God's will according to God's instruction to Adam. Suitable in this passage means this. It's an intimate fitting together as a best friend to handle and share soul issues. She's an ally to her husband. Adam saw... What, uh, God had already claimed that 
he needed a suitable partner because Adam saw when God says, I'm bringing you these, all these animals. And Adam's like, that's great. But none of them was suitable for Adam. Why? Because they were animals and they were already partner, partnered up. And so Adam saw what God had already announced and says, it's not good for man to be alone. And Adam's going, that's right. And so he needed a suitable partner. And what we see is this suitable partner was to be a helper, precious, and custom built, especially for him. And it's just like your own wife that are married. Your own wife was made especially fashioned for you personally. Really? Yes. God created the women, for, and then God created the woman from the man for the purpose of being his helper in accomplishing God's great commission, which we talked about last week in God's plan, uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, the cool plan that God made that we get to actually participate in later, which is a physical heaven and earth that we get to participate in. That was God's design. God, uh, therefore, man was made first with the job of leading the work that God had assigned to him before she was even made, and including the prohibition uh, that he gave to them. So both of these were given before the woman was even made. The woman was to su submit to, I mean, to assist him as a helper mate. This is God's plan of marriage then, that the relationship between a man and a woman was to be sacred, even above any other family members. God created the woman for the man. He had brought her to the man as a formal presentation of the bride. And then Adam gave her the name of woman because she was from him. The two became one flesh, which is the covenant relationship of marriage. And this means, as we saw, and Jesus had, had repeated this along with Paul, Genesis 2.24 is to leave and cleave. Both now, as we see initially, it was the father, I mean, the, the talking about the man, but it's the man and woman. Both are to leave their father and mother, which is a transfer of authority, leadership, and loyalty. They're no longer under the authority and leadership and loyalty of their parents, and now they are to submit to God um, in, the, uh, in the authority that God has given them as man and woman. But yet, they're, so they're still under God's authority, and they're still honoring their parents, but they're not under the authority of, of their parents anymore. They have become um, under the relationship that they have with each other. And they're to cleave together. Cleave together means that as one flesh, it means glued together, soldered together. It's a relationship. It's clinging, and it's an exclusive, unrivaled relationship. You have no other relationship with anybody else like you do with your husband and your wife. There is no other relationship. That means there's no rivalry that gets in between, including kids, brothers, sisters, parents, jobs, or sports, or anything else you can think of. The leave and cleave means one flesh, nothing is to get between. What God has put together, let no man separate. They are to share vision and value on important issues, and they must be united. These things include issues of the home, issues of the children, issues of finances and debt, etc. This chat, uh, verse right here, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians um, verse 7. And this is going to be something else that they share. 1 Corinthians 7. Normally I can give you these things and read them to you, but today we're going to be doing some jumping around for the sake of you getting an opportunity to practice jumping around in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 5, because it says here, they are to share intimacy. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, so they had written him with some questions. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay. We'll, we'll stop there for a second. Chew on that for a minute. Because of the immoralities. Okay. But, oh, here we go. Each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, is what Paul is saying, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again. 
so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So this is what we see. And this combination of what we just learned here about the intimacy and about marriage itself, it puts together, two, it puts away two myths that have even been in the church. In, in fact, it was brought in uh, in the Roman Catholic Church and continues on today and other things. Two myths about marriage and about intimacy that this puts the, both of these passages, Genesis 2 and 1 Corinthians 7. First of all, the purpose of marriage was not to multiply, but so man would not be alone. Man and woman, mankind. That's the purpose of marriage. Multiplying came later. They were told to go multiply now. But the reason for marriage, the purpose of marriage was not necessarily to multiply, but so mankind would not be alone. Second, the purpose of this physical intimacy was not to multiply either. That's not the main purpose, but to provide intimate bonding and enjoyment exclusively in marriage. Okay, so, so therefore, when you know the truth and what the Bible says about these two things, you can see how Satan's lie of saying that marriage is only for multiplication, and once the multiplication is all done, the marriage is just basically trashed. Of course Satan wants you to see that, but the Bible teaches differently. Therefore, listen to this part. This is what people need to hear. Therefore, regardless of the prospect of children, for various reasons, sometimes people can't have children. Sometimes people aren't in a in a position to have children. Maybe they can't physically, maybe they can't financially, maybe they just can't. Therefore, regardless of the prospect of children, marriage is, a, is vital, and it's a God-instituted, uh, it's, it's, it's a God-gifted institution for the blessing of one man and one woman to be a team accomplishing God's will for mankind and in ruling and subduing the earth. What this means is, people don't just have to get married to have kids. People don't have to stop intimacy because they have enough kids. Those two things have just done wreak havoc through the churches and messed up marriages because, uh, well, I don't really, I'm never going to have kids, so why should I get married? Or I'm done having kids, so why should I be intimate? And, and these are two lies of Satan, and we can see that. And we've probably all experienced it one way or another with our own selves or people we've talked to. So now this was God's plan for marriage. Let's look at the problem then. You guys know what the problem is. Almost every week I, I have in one of my points is the problem. And what's the problem? It starts with an S. It's sin. Every time we see this in any of these outlines, it's sin. Okay? Genesis 3. Genesis 3, once again. You know, we're, we're in Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, here we go. The serpent was more crafty than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman... Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the trees, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. We know what God told. We know what God told Adam, her, her, her leader, her husband. But the serpent says this, you surely will not die. Hmm, a little conflict there. This is what he says. But God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, in other words, that she could be like God, she took from its fruit and ate it. <laughs> Look at this part. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate it. Oh, now all of a sudden we see that the, the man's in the picture. Oh, where was he this whole time? Well, it sounds like he was pretty close by. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man, who did he call to? He called to the man. <laughs> Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, this is what God said to him. Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Now, of course God knew. <laughs> He's just putting Adam on the spot to bring it out. 
the truth. <laughs> this is the smart guy's answer. This is what the man said, verse 12. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Oh. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? Well, this and the hers. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent then, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast in the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And her seed, he says, shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he says this, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and in pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, the word desire, it's the same word used in chapter 5. As we, as we go to the, the chapter 5 and it talks about God is telling Cain, hey, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to be over you. The word desire is the same exact word here. It means that the woman's desire would be, would be over the man. That this was the curse. That she, as sin is crouching over to, to be over Cain, the same word is used that a woman is going to desire to be over her husband. But yet, the second part of this verse, he will rule over you. We see conflict already. Then Adam to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, whose voice was he supposed to listen to? The voice of God. Because you listened to the voice of your wife and has eaten from the tree which I have commanded you, saying you shall not eat, cursed is the ground because of you, and in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants in the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken for you are just, and to the just you shall return. So here we are. The woman went off on her own and talked to the talking snake. She goes off on her own. She listened to the, sa the snake, and she took on the spiritual leadership of the couple. She made a spiritual decision for mankind herself, which caused the entire fall of mankind. The husband then took the role of the wife because he followed her as the spiritual leader. He, so the whole thing was switched. She went off and made spiritual decisions, and then he followed her, and God even says, you listen to her, you're supposed to listen to me, and she's supposed to listen to you. So now the husband then took the role of the woman and followed the spiritual leadership, which he now is blamed for the sin of mankind. You always see it's Adam's sin, Adam's sin, Adam's sin. Wait, 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 she was the one that sinned first. Yeah, he's responsible because he's supposed to be leading. He listened to the voice of his wife instead of the voice of God. She was supposed to listen to the voice of her husband according to the voice of God. And so here we see the blame game right out of the chute. Okay? We see the blame game right out of the chute that is still alive and well today. You've heard Flip Wilson. If you watched ever in the 60s, his whole line was, the devil made me do it. We see it today. Oh, there's demons in my marriage. Or, there's a, or I have a demon of alcohol. Or it's somebody else's fault. We also see people blaming God with these things called isms, which means um, it's alcoholism. The Bible says it's sin, but no, it's a disease that uh, a disease that I have. And where diseases come from? Well, God gave me this disease. In fact, God made me born like this to where uh, people claim that that's the reason that they're homosexuals. It's the exact same blame game back in Genesis three that we see today. Is that oh, I have demons in my marriage, or I have this that? It's all the demons' fault or God may be this way, it's God's fault. And we see this right out of the chute. So now we see then that the curse would be this. Oh, let me back up. The man Adam should have crushed the head of the serpent, a talking snake uh, talking to his wife that is trying to get her and him in trouble. He should have crushed the head of the snake and, and said it. instead the second Adam, Jesus Christ would do that on the cross. So the curse then was that the woman would now desire to rule over her husband, but God would hold the man accountable to lead the woman. This has caused problems ever since. Now we have problems from the problem. Divorce. 
Marriage was to be permanent. Jesus said this, and I read this before, uh, Matthew 19, 6. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And yet because of sin, we see this in the next few passages, Jesus permitted divorce, and I'll explain it in a minute, for reasons of adultery, to protect the innocent party. And with this, then, the innocent party was able to then marry again. They were the innocent party. Marriage is to be honored. Paul then explained again uh, somewhat the same, the, the same scenario, only with the, with the different sin. In 1 Corinthians 7, uh, which is later on the, than what we had already read, Paul said that if an unbeliever wants to leave the marriage, the, the believer is commanded to let him leave. In other words, what we see here is, uh, and again, the innocent party is, is, is able to not be cursed by this, but can remarry. We see this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. In all these scenarios, keep this in mind, even today the term divorce or certificate of divorce represents a report, a document of something that has already happened. So when somebody says, uh, oh, you, you, you're, you're divorcing this person, it's like, well, no, no, they've already done the divorce by leaving, I'm simply reporting it to the government of something. A divorce certificate is something that's, just when you get married, after you have your marriage ceremony, the marriage, uh, the wedding occurred, and now you go take it to the government to deliver uh, what had already happened. Well, that's what divorce is. It's, uh, it's reporting something that already happened. And so a divorce then reports that someone has sinfully left a marriage, and let the one left can remarry. The divorce then is a result of somebody leaving the marriage. God is the author of marriage. He determines what marriage is. And so all these things that we're learning about marriage is what God invented the term marriage. It's his, he owns it. And this is what, this is the way it is. It's according to what the Bible says is what marriage is. So when people get married, it must be understood uh, that it's, it's marriage means according to what God says marriage is. Because all kinds of people say, well, I think marriage is this. And I get married. It's like God, it's God he owns this. He owns it. And both parties then are responsible for understanding what God says about marriage. And both parties claim their understanding when they take their vows. And outside of God's definition of marriage, there is no real marriage. There's no such thing. You might go make some agreement that the government says that you can do that, that this titled marriage and it's some, uh, some agreement that the government, but it's not a godly marriage. It's not even a real marriage. And like we say, Satan kidnaps terms and he twists them all around, and we see this all the time. So, with this, we know that marriage is obviously only between a man and a woman. There's no such thing as same-sex marriage. Therefore, listen to this part, because I've heard people struggle with this. Therefore, leaving such a simple relationship is not a divorce, but it's something good. It, it's not a divorce, because it wasn't a marriage in the first place, and I've heard people say, well, now I'm, now I'm, I'm married to this, what am I going to do? It's like, it's not even a marriage. It means just stop sinning. <laughs> and and that's, that's the thing. But, but some people want to make it, oh, well, you know, at least we're, you know, we're just with, with each other or whatever reasons. It's like, it's not a real marriage. And so therefore, it's not even a real divorce. It's, 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 it's nothing. Just don't do that anymore. Someone who's married then, listen to this part. Someone who's married, and by the way, this affects all of us here in this room, well, most of us, but it also affects us in counseling other people. Just keep this in mind. Someone who denies these biblical truths that we're learning here, and these truths and responsibilities, somebody who denies these things, they were never really, truly married in the first place. Because this is what marriage says. And if they say, well, I don't agree with it, Oh, well, then you weren't married then, <laughs> because this is what it is. Someone who initially agrees, this happens, but then rejects these things later, has left the marriage, because these are firm. So, we know that divorce is a major problem with the problem, but there's another one. One is, faulty views of persons and roles. This is another problem with the sin in marriage. Gender confusion. Okay, we talked about that. This is what gender confusion causes for you and your kids and everybody watching you. It causes this dilemma uh, that men sometimes can be womanizers. 
They think it's okay to be like Satan was to Eve and to manipulate women and to take advantage of them. This sin causes a man in many times, and we're going to get into the men more tomorrow, I mean next week, but, but one of the uh, problems with this sin is that men can tend to be womanizers. On the other hand, as we talked about, uh, men can also tend to be mama's boys and just decide like Adam, like I don't even want to argue with her, She's got to, she's, she wants to be in charge. And so we see that, and like I said, there's even the possibility of the combination of the two is is as is, is a guy who's being a mama's boy around his own wife, and then he goes off and womanizes other women and try to make up for some deficit. So we can see all this sin is related to the same thing. We also see these, these uh, gender confusion causes women to go towards uh, what we call in the Bible Jezebels, described in Proverbs 7, is women that become adulteresses and manipulate men into getting the things that they want. We also see that this gender confusion that we cause as married people, if we don't do this right, we participate in, in confusing people to where homosexuality is even um, looked at as, uh, as well. I don't know, the, I, I'm looking at these Christian couples and I'm seeing all this and, and, and it causes all this confusion and victims of sex abuse we see. We see that it causes spousal conflict, it causes uh, parental and child conflict, it causes sibling conflict, and it causes even abuse inside the home and outside the home. These problems with sin and men and women not understanding what they're supposed to be as men and women causes all these problems. So, the problem of this sin has almost destroyed, almost, almost, almost destroyed the gospel's witness to the world, but not quite. Because <laughs> God's not going to let that happen. So now we have here the program and persons of this plan. In part one here, as we said, we'll be talking about the wife, verses 22 to, 30, uh, to 24. Next week we'll talk about part two, it'll be the husband. So Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their own husbands. 1 Peter 3 gives us uh, other information on that that you can look at now or later on. But what we see is, we see this in 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 1, as soon as I can get to it. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your here we go, own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of the Lord God. For in this way, in the former times, the holy women also, who hoped for, in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you have become her children, if you do what is, what is right, without, be, without being frightened by any fear. So Paul reminds us, it's, it's the own husband, submitting to your own husband. It doesn't mean you have to be submitted to somebody else's husband. And the manner is, is a quiet, gentle spirit. And this will be more attractive than the outside of appearance. And the term feminist, as we have started out in the, word in the 60s, is not uh, attractive. And it's an actually the opposite. They're not feminists, they're not feminine. But a godly woman is, is, it has the inner beauty coming out. And a woman is not to have, listen to this part, and it's throughout the Bible as if it could really happen. A, a godly woman is not to have a nagging, contentious, or shameful attitude, which is worse for the husband than even this. Proverbs 12, 4. Having rottenness to his bones, living on the corner of the roof, living in a desert land, living near a constantly dripping uh, on a rainy day, 
We see these in the Proverbs. And it says also in Proverbs 27, 15, that for a man to have a wife like that, it is, she's, she's harder to tame than trying to hang on to the wind or a handful of oil. It's in the Bible, it must be true. This fully developed sinful attitude of a woman could lead all the way, it could lead all the way to the adulteress of Proverbs 7, which we'll look at at another time, which is the opposite of Proverbs 31, which is the virtuous wife, which we will look at at another time also, really soon. So, and also says her, hub, her, reject, her subjection to her husband is to be without fear. And we saw that Sarah's faith to honor God gave her to trust to submit to her husband. In other words, people might say, well, I'm kind of afraid to give up that ground to my husband. And, and the Bible saying she, she can trust in God. She doesn't have to worry about giving up ground because if, if I give up ground, he's going to take advantage of it. No, the, the godly woman doesn't have to worry about that because if she's in the Lord, she trusts the Lord. And we see this also in, in uh, Titus 3 through 5, I'm sorry, it's Titus 2, 3 through 5, that the older women are to teach the younger women these things. So I'm going to be priming the pump with this, but it really is, when we get down to the, the details, it's up to the older women to teach the younger women these things. And it talks about in Titus 2, 3 through 5 that the older women are to teach the younger women in such things as loving their husbands and loving their children and being workers at home even. And, and the reason that this workers at home is here is because many women have been duped by, this, by the false god of, of having to go to college or having to be working outside the home and make it because they've been duped by, uh, we need to make more money. Um, and they get career oriented and they could lose touch with their wife and their mother um, jobs, and they could maybe even addict the family to bringing in more money, and or even the guilt of what might you know a, a girl's father invested forty grand into college, and now she feels like she has to go. So listen to this part though; it's really important. Is with this, a woman working outside the home is not, or even going to college isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means that there's ramifications. Um, with all this that you just need to understand and between a husband and a wife because it can it, it can obviously work It's just these are things you need to be careful of a Submissive attitude from being spirit-filled will help you put these things in place and her Listen to this part guys. Well, I mean ladies, but you, you can understand this but listen to this guys because There's gonna be guys doing this and women doing this too in this part. I think everybody look real in this part Her submission is not based on her husband being a believer or smart, or handsome, loving, or even nice. This command for a wife to submit is different than the commands to obey their parents or their masters, as we see. She's not to be treated as a slave or a child. And this is a partnership. It's a partnership. It's a partnership. Just the way the believers are given different gifts to contribute to the church, the husband and wife being different gifts to the table. He was created uh, from the dirt outside the garden and placed into it. She was created from the man inside the garden. Men and women are different. There's no confusion. And this is the mandate then that we see that women are just to submit to their husbands. But this is the manner. And this is the part that you can, that'll help you. Uh, verse 22 and 23, as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Unto the Lord, it's just like we read in, in verse 21, our submitting to one another is unto the Lord. Listen to this, ladies, and, and I think you can understand this. If you try to submit to just your husband without the unto the Lord part, you will be submitting towards what some may view your husband as an idiot, a slob, or a tyrant, and therefore, you're going to have no motivation if you see these things in your husband. When you submit to your husband as unto the Lord, it actually motivates you that you can handle it. But if you see, if you're submitting to, uh, if you see all these flaws in your husband, and you say, how can I submit to that? It, 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 you're not going to be motivated. But when you're submitting to the Lord, like, okay, Lord, right now he's having a bad moment. He's, he's doing this or he's doing that wrong or whatever. But... If you're submitting to the Lord, it's going to be easier for you to understand that it's not because he deserves it or because he's a great guy. Because every once in a while, about once every year or so, the man uh, might mess up. 
or more often than that. The husband is then considered the head, and the head is often viewed as that which contains the brain, which can be disputed as far as who's smarter. Oh, the husband's the head. Well, not in my family. He, he's not very smart. But, but this context here, the head is used, uh, meaning higher status, superior rank, and the symbol of the father or the head of the family. Therefore, it's not necessarily the guy with the brains that makes him the head. It's because he's been uh, given that authority by God. So the manner of submission then is, is that we saw it's unto the Lord. The model then is, is just as the church is subject to Christ, verse 24, so also wives are to be their husbands in everything. In everything it says, this means all marriage and family decisions, just as Christ, just as the church prays to the Lord in supplication, the wife brings her requests to the husband. The husband has the final say, the husband has to determine these things, but just as we bring our request to the Lord and we ask uh, things of the Lord, he may or may not grant them because he's the head. In the same way that the women are to recognize that they need to go ask their husbands about things. And we'll learn later on that there's a whole bunch of things that the husband's going to give his wife that you don't even have to ask me. I already know that you can handle this. We know that that's going to happen. But overall, the husband is held accountable and makes the final decision on things. But yet, but yet with this, which is not like Christ in the church, um, as his helper maid, she is needed. Uh, he is ne she is needed by her husband to bring forth suggestions. So Jesus doesn't need your suggestions or my suggestions. But so our relationship between the church and Christ is that that we can go forward with him with requests and ask him for things, but we don't, we, we, don't, um, we don't actually tell him what to do. On the other hand, we as men know that, uh, we, even though we don't like it at the time, when a wife gives us su suggestions, that it's actually uh, many times a blessing. So the wife is to do that with her husband. Because, as you guys, well nobody will, you guys won't admit, but you women will, she often can detect blind spots in his thinking as she was created to be the part of the team making up for his lacking. So she's going to see things that we don't see, and we don't like to hear it, but that's just the way it is. We, we have to pay attention to some things. The husband needs the wife's input. Now, it says um, that the wife is, to subject, uh, is, is subject to her husband in everything. Let's talk about that for a minute. And everything does not mean that she is to submit to him in sin, in his sin doesn't mean to participate in his sin with, with, with him. She's not required to go rob banks with her husband. It also means that she's not required to submit to a sin of abuse against her. So, so when a husband is trying to get a wife to sin, the answer is no. Christ would never ask you to sin, and that's one thing because we know that that's going to happen, and the answer has to be no. So she is to submit and partner with his pursuit to submit to God's will. That's what she's supposed to do. So God's plan for marriage is to leave and cleave as one flesh. Man's problem with marriage is sin. In the case of the woman, she will naturally default to being over her man. This can manifest in her into being nagging, contentious, bossy, and even to the point of being adulterous if it goes that far. Now, let me just say one thing here. While we're looking at roles and gender, adulteresses aren't just born adulteresses. They learn it from somebody, and they learn it from their parents, or they learn it from somebody that's in the role of the parents. So keep these things in mind. They don't just all of a sudden hatch out of an egg as, a, as an adulteress. And so these things can start out with nagging, contentiousness, being bossy, and go down that road. They don't just show up one day being hatched as adulteresses. Now, eliminating this sin can only come from being filled with the Holy Spirit. So God's program then for marriage is this, that a woman is to submit to her husband as to the Lord, and a man is to love his wife. And we're going to get into that. So God's program for marriage will glorify God, showcase the truth of the gospel, and bless the submissive wife. And this can only be accomplished by her being filled with the Holy Spirit. So we saw the beginning here. Part one deals with the introduction of this whole thing and the program for wives. Next week, we'll deal with the program for the husbands and the conclusion of the study. 
and whatever questions we, we might have later, um, it's a, it's a, just this particular topic today can go on and go on and go on, and that's why the Titus 2 uh, study between the women really goes and, and digs into this any deeper. But this is where we are uh, for this, and we can see that even from the woman's side, uh, and, and things she needs to watch out for, we as men are kind of hit between the running lights on a couple things too, uh, some of the truths that have come out, and the truth is, is that next week um, we're going to deal with the men, and uh, so you, got, you guys got to just be here. You, you, if you've already shown up here and listened to the woman parts of the men, you, if you're not here, it means that you're just running away. So you need to be here for this. Let's go ahead and pray.